I'm Solana Rice, the co-founder and co-executive director of Liberation in a Generation, a national movement support organization building the power of people of color to totally transform our economy, who controls it, how it works, and more importantly, for whom. I'm excited to guest edit this edition of The Forge, an online journal for on organizing strategy and practice by and for organizers, along with the co-directors of Black Visions, Candace Montgomery and Miski Noor. We'll be looking back at the uprisings last summer and the longer movement to defund and abolish the police and prison industrial complex. I'm here today with Mariam Kaba, the abolitionist organizer, educator, and writer who recently published We Do This Till We Free Us, Abolitionist Organizing and Transformative Justice. We're talking about how her work has changed over the last year, why she writes, and how she keeps visioning at the forefront of her work. I, I'm curious from you, Miriam, uh, what has changed for you the most in your work since the uprisings last May? Uh, you're, you're known not to relish the spotlights. <laughs> and <laughs> so I'm curious about how you navigated shifts in your work um, mm -hmm. and especially all the attention that uh, has come your way. Um, and I'm also just curious just generally about your past uh, year, um, yeah. in your perspective? Well, you know, I'm lucky, you know, I'm, I'll be turning 50 in October. So I'm not a kid and that's helpful. Um, I pick, you know, I'm in my third season of life. I've been doing work for a long time. And because I know myself very well, I was able to, um, like I didn't get swept up by the interest, you know, I, responded to a lot of requests from organizers, local organizers around the country who were trying to figure out how to, you know, navigate this moment around defund. Um, so I did a lot of small um, convenings for some younger organizers around bringing together people who have been longtime practitioners of transformative justice, for, for example. Um, so they could ask questions and um, so those folks could talk with those younger people um, and more less experienced people. Um, so I used uh, kind of the the years of building with people who had been doing this work for a while to help marshal their talents and thoughts into spaces where we could have cross-generational and cross-experience conversations. So I did a lot of that. Um, I wrote some stuff, you know, I co-wrote our defund toolkit for interrupting criminalization, which was just an attempt to, you know, offer like, like, um, talk back to all the noise that was happening and people's mm -hmm. definitions of what defund was and wasn't to, uh, to like put kind of a marker around, you know, it really is defund to abolish. So I was really involved in just multiple kinds of things. I also tried very hard to think about what are the resources that people still need right now? Like what are the things that we need to create and develop? Tools, resources, information um, that could be put to best use on the ground locally. So I've been doing a lot of stuff like that. And, um, you know, I've been doing some uh, jumping in to help around uh, conflicts that have, you know, emerged within particular organizations during this time. Um, so I've been helping people navigate and think through how to address issues that have been coming up for them um, in this moment. And that's led to um, a partnership. I'm I'm engaged in right now with Dragonfly um, to create a grievance protocol and we'll mm. do some training of particular groups that have reached out to us with, you know, concerns and needs. Um, and so we'll do that this summer and help people like, what do you need to put in place before all the X hits the fan? Um, because you've yeah. got all this money coming in and because all these things are happening and there's friction, you know, within the organization and outside of it. And so a lot of people are struggling um, in this movement moment to just be able to hold their containers together. Um, and that's really important as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that, that's so, I mean, one, you've been doing, you've been doing a, a lot. And uh, what I hear is both being in community 
and supporting sort of movement infrastructure yeah. and also a lot of framing and and writing. Um, I'm curious, you, you mentioned like you were able to be strategic and selective. I know that um, when Haymarket Press first approached you about a book, eh, it wasn't your, your top, <laughs> top priority. No. Um, I'm, I'm curious about when, when you sat down to say, okay, this is the time to do, we do this till we free us. Mm -hmm. um, what was that, what was that strategy? Uh, what was calling to you? Yeah, you, you know, yes. So I've been asked, not just, you know, I've been asked by Haymarket for a few years and I've been asked on and off by other publishers to, um, you know, write a book uh, on something or other. The The thing that I hope people know about me is that I, I write all the time. I hate it. I don't enjoy it. I don't want to do it, but I'm writing all the time in some way. I'm, you know, writing curriculum units. I'm writing, you know, uh, all sorts of kinds of things like that. But also I've, I'm a self-publisher. Um, I have been a zine maker since I was a teenager. I, you know, self-published a workbook on community accountability um, in 2019. I self-published a children's book called Missing Daddy. Um, also in 2018, before it got picked up by Haymarket to be published by them later. So we'd already sold like 2,500 copies of the book on the self-published children's book before Haymarket picked it up to you know, publish it and distribute it that way. So I've always made books, right? Like in different kinds mm -hmm. of ways. The, but, you know, to sit down and like make a book through a publisher, all that stuff, like has not appealed to me. Mm -hmm. I like having control over what I'm doing. Um, and I like to, and not, not control in this kind of like megalomaniac sense, but I like to decide what I want to share. And I like yeah. to, um, you know, I like to be able to say no, like that's not going to, you know, and so I didn't really know how all that was going to work. But, um, but as you mentioned, um, when the uprisings happened, uh, started happening, um, Julie Fain reached back out to me. I think it must have been towards the end of June or something. And Julie is like, okay, so I would love to do something with you. How about if we take pieces you've written over the years and put it together into a volume? And if you have anything new that you want to like shove in there too, we'll just take that. But you don't have to write anything brand new, mm -hmm. you know. And the thing that would put me over the edge was they, they mentioned that Tamara Knopper would edit, that she agreed mm -hmm. to edit the project. And I really have a lot of respect for Tamara and Tamara's, you know, uh, her intellect and her political, um, her political commitments. And so I was like, well, if Tamara's going to edit and you all, all understand that I'm super busy and I don't. I'm not going to have time to like weigh in a hundred million times, like, you know, do the thing and then send it to me and give me a, a deadline mm -hmm. by which you need me to like answer some questions or read things or whatever. But that's the, that's the level, you know, here. Yeah. Um, and, um, and Tamara agreed to write an intro for the book. So really it was like, okay, you will put together things you've already created. We will do, we'll handle like the editing parts of this and you just have to weigh in from time to time to let us know where, you know, this is what we think should go in and you can decide whether or not you think other things should go in. So that's what really pushed me over the edge and I agreed to do it mainly because I wanted, I was, I thought, I, I keep getting asked, particularly by younger organizers for resources they can read about PC abolition. Mm -hmm. And I always give the same, you know, I give like, I, I give them tons of reading lists. I'm a reading list machine constantly because I'm reading all the time, right? Um, and, you know, our, our prison's obsolete, Golden Gulag, you know, any number mm -hmm. of books, George Jackson's Blood in My Eye, like read all these books. Um, and then I thought, well, a small book that could be a door for younger people to walk through if they want could be useful. And so that's the that's the mindset I had and that's the audience I had in mind. I thought all these young people are now activated to this work, are thinking about defunding police, which is, you know, a step an abolitionist step towards ending policing. And I thought, you know, 
this might be useful. And maybe they'll, you know, even though I, I can just send people individual things I've written, it, the list is long and it can be like, you know, harrowing for people to be like, oh, well, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But putting it all together in this kind of way, maybe it will provide people with a way, um, a way to engage. And I had no expectations whatsoever beyond just like a few organizers that I know <laughs> using the book for what they want it to have it, you know, be. And ridiculous to have it, you know, be a, a get on the New York Times bestseller list is ridiculous. Like that, it just is bonkers, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. So, um, so yeah, so it turned out to be something that people really are responding to beyond yeah. the initial group of people I had intended in my mind as the audience for this. It is a loving and caring opening and offering. I, I just, I really appreciated it. And I, um, I just also love the way you talk about the book itself. Um, and the, the Forge is a, is a journal by and for organizers. And mm -hmm. the Forge is trying to facilitate a practice um, for organizers writing about organizing, right? And you, you, you mentioned yeah. you hate writing. Right? I, do. So I'm, I I'm, absolutely despise I'm curious, it. Yes. I'm curious about what advice do you have for folks that are like, I'm on that same train. Yeah. I, for, personally, for me, I, it takes me so long to write. I yes. Yes. quibble over every word. I edit <laughs> before I even write. Um, so I, I twofold. One, how do you get over those hurdles? But why do you think it's important for organizers to write ourselves, mm -hmm. themselves into the record? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that the reason I write, I always say I'm not a writer. I'm an organizer who sometimes writes and or an educator who sometimes writes. And I think important, and the reason I do it is to, be accountable because I tell mm. younger organizers in my life that they should write and, yes. and not even that they should write publicly, but that they should document their work mm. because first of all, for me, I kind of never really know what I think about something till I see it written down. So I've always been a big journaler. So when I say I hate to write, I mean like I hate uh, I hate the public Publish, I hate yeah. public writing or writing that needs to be shared or should be shared with other people. I'm always journaling, jotting things down, writing down snippets. You know, I'm always doing that. Um, but because that's how I I know what I think about an issue or a thing or a feeling or whatever. But um, but I always wanted to make sure that um, young organizers that I was in community with would document their practice both because it's easy to it's easy to lose track of what you're doing and like mm. to lose track of like why you're doing it you know in the work when you're just mm -hmm. door knocking and working on an intensive campaign and having to turn people out for actions and when you are stressed out about the constituent meeting that you have to be part of helping people prepare for and when you are like all the things that go into campaigns and all the things that go into the daily work of creating organization when it's very hard to like see yourself in that and to reflect we almost never have reflection time and so writing mm -hmm. can provide some reflection and an opportunity for you to see what you think about what's going on. So that's one of the main reasons. And then the second is that often it's not the people who are engaged in the actual work that get to tell the story of it. No matter how, how terrific a writer from the outside looking in or a historian who looks back later on, they're not going to ever know what you were feeling or thinking in that moment. They're not going to know what it, even if you do interviews mm. and they interview you like 10 years later, it won't be the same as what you wrote as it was happening and as you were experiencing it. Um, and it will be very useful to have your voice centered in that. Not as, not as like, you know, not because, you know, again, organizers want to be organizers in the back, leaders in the front. I get it. But I think just being able to say like, yeah, I'm really 
it turns out that I was so stressed out during that time. I didn't mm. even realize how stressed out I really was. Or, you know, gosh, we made this decision instead of this decision and it made all the difference or it didn't make all the difference. Um, yeah, so that's part of why I think writing and documenting and writing yourself into the record is an important thing. And it also helps people coming after you to have something to hold on to um, mm. and something to to even just throw against the wall and that wall being what you wrote, you know, and yeah. they are creating their own thing. And they are like th this, you know, boy, this doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't work for me, but having something to throw against is sometimes helpful as well. Mm, yeah. That really resonates with me because I, I have been journaling for a while as well. And for me, it's a, it's not only reflection, it's a processing. Yeah. Um, and you know, we, we, the way you talk about that is like, oh, writing also helps you make it real. Like it's mm -hmm. it's not just uh, in the abstract. It's not just the outer. It's what you're actually processing internally. It, it helps me let go of things. It helps yep. me say like, oh, that was important. Even things that yep. I don't think are important. Like, oh, wait, yeah, I did a lot of stuff. Like, I'm glad I wrote it down. <laughs> Yes. And I also suggest that if it's not writing, I mean, writing is you can write in different ways. Like I mentioned, journaling is a way of writing and is writing that's valid and good. You don't have to publish anything that you do. The other thing is you can also just dictate. Yeah. You can just take a, a um, you know, um, a recorder and just dictate your thoughts to it and then send it off for, to somebody to get transcribed. And there you have writing. So, so what do you personally do to get get over the, the the hurdle that you have about writing? Yeah, I just, I don't like it. So I just make sure that I am not going to, like, I'm not, I'm not hard on myself for, for like for procrastinating. I'm not, you know, if I don't get it, anything done that day, then I just didn't get it done that day. Um, I'm very notorious for like turning down Every almost everything that has been significant, I turned down first. So I've been like, <laughs> I don't really have time, or I don't really want to, or you know. Um, one of the reasons I like so much collaborating and writing with people is because it lets me be accountable to another person, and it also lets me have another person to throw ideas off of. I like that. Like I like the process of being with other people and thinking together. That I really like. You know, yeah. getting it down on paper and having to make it make sense is another story altogether. <laughs> so I try to I try to use that actually as an opportunity to actually write because if I am in like you know people I respect like my you know my friend Kelly Hayes I've written a lot with or you know I've written with my friend Erica Miners or you know all these things like I want they're great thought partners mm -hmm. for me and the fact that they're both organizers too helps because you know I'm not talking to people who don't have the language or the same vocabulary or even the same values like mm -hmm. you know we mm -hmm. are we're, we're steeped in the same kind of belief about how in, what is important around social transformation and change or the world we want to see you know we're also like simpatico as all being abolitionists. Like the, mm -hmm. I like that. I like to have that as an opportunity and writing can be an excuse to get your comrades together and to think together when you don't usually have time to think, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love, I, I, those are great points. So finding, giving yourself grace, yeah. right? Not, not, not trying to push, um, yeah. not feeling the pressure of needing to put it out in the world. It's you for, it's, it it's a project to. for you. Yeah. Exactly. You don't have to put these things out. They don't have to be public. You know, yeah. nobody even ever has to read it, but you. And find your people. Find your people yeah. that you really want to do this with. <laughs> this is, but that's, you know, that's a huge part of organizing. Yeah. Um, you know, find people that you can work alongside and, you know, build with. So yeah, absolutely. Well, I do want to talk about abolition. Uh, you write in one of your essays that abolition is an organizing practice. Tell us, tell, tell me more about um, what you mean by abolition is an organizing practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an organizing practice and strategy in the sense that um, the questions that abolition asks of you 
are excellent questions for applying to organizing in general. So, so um, first of all, I see abolition as a process, not a destination. And so that means that you're always in motion and you're always, uh, you're always trying to, you know, kind of figure out what the next best step is. Um, that's just a part of, you know, kind of an abolitionist organizing practice. Um, I, I always say like the most important thing you can do is to improve your questions. Stop trying to find the answer. There is no the answer ever for anything. There are multiple responses. And so the questions that you ask are very, very important because they'll lead you to some response that will be better than a response that a bad question might, in, you know, enable. So, um, so you know, uh, years ago I wrote a piece during the height of the kind of uh, 2014, 2015 mobilizations after Mike Brown was killed um, around, you know, I was very frustrated with the conversations and the demands that people were making at the time, which were de decidedly not abolitionist demands that were being made. And, you know, people were talking about body cameras all the time and more training as usual. And, um, and I jotted down like in, I don't know, 10 minutes, this thing, uh, uh, titled police reforms you should always oppose and posted it on my blog prison culture and it went viral and i think mm -hmm. it was at that time because people were like oh someone mm -hmm. is giving a set of like steps mm -hmm. to consider to decide whether or not we should be supporting these ideas or not like thank you for just giving very short framing that helps us think you know, um, and can, and that gives us like ammunition as we're trying to push back on various things by saying like, does it give something like, to give more money to the system? Is it doing this? Is it doing that? Because we know that abolitionists are always talking about how we should chip away at the system. How do we shrink the system? How do we shrink the power of the system? How do we divest from the system while we invest in new and other things? So, um, so yeah, so th that's part of what I mean by abolition being an organizing practice and strategy is that you actually are always doing that kind of assessing. Um, you're always trying to figure out what the questions are that will help you get better responses. Yeah. Um, you also write that abolition doesn't care about your feelings. And I, you know, I think that's a, that's a hard one, right? When we're, mm -hmm. you know, it's an emotion, like we are working mm -hmm. on emo the, the work is emotional of course. <laughs> and how do we, uh, maintain rigor in the principles that are critical to abolition while still well, recognizing I mean, that we have our, our feelings. <laughs> yeah. I think, I mean, it's, it's purposely provocative that yeah. point, you know, that abolition is not about your fucking feelings. And we were basically, you know, Rachel and I were going back and forth. And I, and I said, I want to write a piece saying abolition is not about your fucking feelings, mainly because I was kind of getting so, I'm always so concerned when everything becomes individualized mm -hmm. and then quote unquote, individualized in order then for everybody to generalize. What I mean by that is it is not actually the case and it is not actually the true that um, everything, that your personal feelings about everything should become what we use to determine mm. policy. Mm. Mm -hmm. That That's just dangerous and reactionary. And we have to we have to figure out how to attend to people's, of course, of course, I care about people's feelings. Of course, I care how you feel about a thing, you know, especially if I'm your friend and your family member and I care about you. I want to talk with you. I want to process with you, you know, so uh, yes to all of that. But like at the level at which we're, we're going to organize together, and try to figure out how to make a transformation and a change in the world. We have to be mindful to not be reactionary and focused on our feelings to the detriment of everybody else's feelings and everybody else's ideas. And that's part mm -hmm. of it. Melissa Harris Perry says, said something many years ago 
which I still use all the time, which is that personal experience is a great place to generate hypotheses, but it's a lousy place to test them. Mm. And I really think the thing that that suggests and helps us really understand is that your personal feelings about something are valid, but it doesn't mean that the interpretations that you make are necessarily valid, right? Using yeah. those feelings. So like, I want you to have your feelings. I want you to feel your feelings and do all of that kind of stuff. And it's a great place again, to like generate hypotheses about how the world might operate. But it isn't a good place to test them because your individual feelings are not enough to hold mm. all the things that we need as a society. And certainly the things we ask the state to do in our names, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's really what that's about. And I think because a lot of people are just like, you know, well, my personal experience, my personal opinion, I'm like, yes, that's all great. But <laughs> your personal opinion can't be the controlling thing. Just like my personal vision of the world is means nothing because abolition is a collective project. We're going to have to fight it out amongst each other and figure out where we want to go together. It's not just going to be me coming up on a high and making decisions about what it is mm. and how it, shit's going to go down and what we're going to do, right? Yeah. Um, so it's similar to that. Uh, you wrote in the New York Times last summer that we have been so indoctrina indoctrinated with the idea that we solve problems by policing and caging people that many cannot imagine anything other than prisons and the police as solutions to violence and harm. It reminds me of sort of a, we've had imagination capture, right? It just, it we can't mm -hmm. even, <laughs> we, you know, heads or tails. Um, how do you keep visioning at the forefront of your work, just balancing mm -hmm. all of the things that you're you're doing? Um, yeah. how, do you, how do you keep your vision for safety clear I'm always, the two things that I always say is I'm always practicing. So I'm always, always, always working with other people on creating more safety for all of us. And that means, you know, sometimes I'm facilitating community accountability processes within my communities. And by that, I mean like in multiple kinds of ways. Somebody's caused somebody else grievous harm. Oftentimes I'm called in to stepping in to help if I can and I'm, I have the bandwidth and the ability and I feel like it's a space that I can actually contribute positively to. Um, and we work together and figure out what is going to support the people in that situation best to get on a road and a journey and on a path towards their own healing, which I obviously am not necessarily going to be on with them. Um, but that they can be better than, in a better place than when we got together in the first place. So that's a concrete way where I'm always trying to make within my communities spaces where we can do that together. So that's one way that I'm always doing it. And the other thing, and that, that, that is one of the most important sites of needing to practice imagination mm. because you need to think about creative ways to resolve problems. Mm. Um, and it's not always going to be the same thing. If you're not going to rely on the police and you're not going to rely on prisons and you're not, you have to constantly be thinking about what is, what are people's wants? What are people's needs? What can actually be uh, offered? What won't be offered? It's all a negotiation usually. Mm -hmm. Like you're always trying to figure that kind of stuff out. So you, you, don't, you can't just be staying stagnant and you have to always be thinking like, what else? What else is there? What else can we do? What will people accept? Um, so that's one way. And then the second way I think for me is that I'm really committed to reading and thinking with others. And by that, I mean, like, political education constantly mm. keeps me grounded around that. You know, I'm, uh, I co-founded a, a formation um, called Survived and Punished New York. And one of the things we do is every general meeting is we have one hour of the meeting is political education. So either mm. we bring somebody in or somebody from our group facilitates the conversation or whatever. We just do it as a normal practice monthly, you know? Um, and that's a thing that's important because mm. 
it allows us to see what's happening, but also see past what's happening to thinking about, hmm, what else, what else, what else, you know? Mm. Um, so that's secondly, super important. And then finally, like, I'm a big fan of art of all different kinds. Um, I'm a big, you know, I love poetry. I love beauty from visual arts. I'm so interested in, um, you know, film. I'm so interested in music. I'm really steeped in all those things. And art, you know, at its best um, does what Alice Walker said, it, you know, what Alice Walker told us years ago was that oppression puts ceilings on our, puts a ceiling on our brain. And mm -hmm. I've changed that to oppression puts a ceiling on our imagination. Mm -hmm. And I believe that art can help lift that ceiling yeah. off our imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I'm engaged in it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I have a lot of um, respect for artists. Um, because they really help us to imagine differently and to even change our what we see by a, just a little bit and gives us mm -hmm. a different perspective. Last question. What's being said but remains unheard? I'm particularly interested in what's being said about abolition but remains unheard. Um, I think people have a lot of ideas about abolition or abolitionists, but don't actually engage abolition as an idea in any sort of rigorous way. Um, I don't think most people have read much about PAC abolition beyond, you know, a couple of articles here or there. If, if that, I don't think most people, um, yeah, so I think that there's a lot that's being said that people don't hear or don't access. Um, there's always, I'm always so interested when somebody will say, yeah, yeah, but you know, borders, you know, like immigration, like they'll throw something out as though that's supposedly like, that's not something that PAC abolition addresses. I'm like, but you do not, have you not read Harsha Walia? Like, have you not read like all these people who focus on an abolitionist you know, uh, argument around no borders and, you know, mm -hmm. like, I just don't mm -hmm. like, it's always, there's always, whatever you think is not happening is actually happening somewhere. Mm. Almost always, almost always. I mean, you know, it's just that we don't, ha we get, the world is, is huge and small. So we don't get to see everything and, and hear everything that's going on. But it's, you know, it's like, well, no one's talking about this. Well, not true. People have been talking about that. No one's making the link between the military industrial complex and policing. Oh no, actually a <laughs> lot of people are doing that. In fact, you know, the dissenters, a whole group of young folks, that's what they're organizing around, you know, demilitarization and, you know, PIC abolition. Like I, I can point you to things, you know, people, nobody's talking about disability justice and so-and-so. Yes, there are a whole bunch of abolitionists that pioneered that work. I mean, like Mia Mingus and other people like, so you, I, I'm just, you know, I think the, the conversations are happening. The, the scholarship is happening. The thought process is happening. Like you, you can be a PhD abolitionist and be an anarchist. Mm. You can be a PhD abolitionist and a communist and a socialist you know, or even a democratic mm. socialist. I think that's as far as I'll go. I don't think <laughs> liberal. Yeah, I don't think liberals are, are PAC abolitionists, you know? So I think because the the, the tie to the law, you know, um, yeah. uh, as being kind of sacrosanct for a lot of them. So I think that, I think there are different kinds of um, politics and then people are PAC abolitionist within their politics. Mm. And I think maybe that's not something that people know, right? Because mm. there's arguments over what is the role of the state? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we engage the state? Like those arguments are happening within PAC abolition and maybe people don't know that. Mm. Maybe people don't know that, you know, uh, PAC abolitionists are thinking constantly about um, what, you know, what is, how do we, like, how do we actually deal with capitalism because PAC abolitionist, uh, PAC abolitionism is inherently anti-capitalist. Like, what does that really mean in practice? 
I think a lot of people are now trying to figure out what is the relationship between PAC abolition and um, a just transition around climate and environmental mm. justice. And maybe more people need to like bring those things together. I'm certainly trying to learn more about climate justice uh, and then trying to incorporate what is a PAC abolitionist, uh, you know, like how do I assess what I would want to see happen around climate justice mm -hmm. from a PAC abolitionist lens. Um, so these are these are things that are always in conversations happening at least amongst people I hear from and people I'm in community with. We have lots of disagreements and I think that's okay. You know, yeah. there are lots of people arguing around community control of police right now. You know, like, is that an abolitionist demand, right? Like that's, that's our work. Our work is to ask those questions and talk to each other about it. Talk to each other about it. And, you know, we may not come to one end answer, but at least we'll be raising the questions. Mm -hmm. Mariam, thank you so much for taking this time with me and sharing your thoughts and your reflections and your practice with the folks at The Forge. Thank you, Solana. Thank you for listening. For more conversations like this one, visit forgeorganizing.org. We'll see you on Twitter at Forge Organizing. For more information on Black Visions, visit blackvisionsmn.org or follow them on Twitter at blackvisionsmn. You can find more information on Liberation in a Generation at liberationinageneration.org or follow them on Twitter at liberationin. Thank you to Nino Fernandez for post-production audio and editing. And thanks to all of you for listening. Take care and stay safe, everyone.